Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the last days and the signs of the last days. What will be happening? What will be taking place? And in chapter 23, he actually tells the disciples and Israel, he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I came to you and I would have gathered you under my wing as a mother hen does her brood. He said that in chapter 23. What was he saying? He came to gather the Israelites. He came as a Messiah to his people. Why? Because God had a covenant with the people of Israel. But when he came, they rejected him. And he says, you're not going to say, see me again as the Messiah until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When will that happen? That's at the end of the seven years of tribulation. That's the culmination of the tribulation period when Christ, the second coming at the battle of Armageddon, that's when Israel as a whole, as a people will say, there he is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He was and is the Messiah. Amen. Well, in chapter 24, before he goes to Calvary, he answers questions that the disciples had. Look with me at verse 1, Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down talking about the temple, Herod's temple in Jerusalem. And this was fulfilled in 70 AD, about 40 some years later. The Romans came into Jerusalem and they stone by stone destroyed the temple. It was fulfilled. All right. Look with me at verse four. Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying that I am Christ and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation, verse 7, shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and, go ahead and highlight it, <laughs> earthquakes and divers or various different places. And all these, listen to what he says in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now I want you to think about something and learn something this morning. He's talking to and about the nation of Israel. So when he says these things, when he declares these things, he's talking to Israel as a whole, as a people. You follow me? So this is the context for the nation of Israel, not necessarily for you and I, because when all this stuff starts to take place in its heightened level, the church will be out of here. This is just the beginning signs of what is to come. And it will only intensify into what we call the tribulation period. And we're going to talk about that this morning. All right, look with me. Uh, verse 9, and they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. This is the Jews who will be martyred during the tribulation period. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. But he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Once again, not today, not you and I. It's not telling us that if we endure until the coming of the Lord, we'll be saved. No, he's talking about the Jewish Israelites who are under the judgment of God, under the tyrannical reign of the Antichrist during the tribulation period. If they endure this hellacious time, think about it. And let me add all those who are left upon the earth around the world. Look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When I was a kid, I used to watch Paul Crouch on TBN, and he would quote this verse when he was taking up money to try to put satellite dishes in the air so that everybody in the world could get Christian television on their screen. 
And I used to think to myself even then, you know what, I don't think that's talking about today. But it's, and it's not. The gospel will be preached to all the world. Now, it's being preached in all the world, don't get me wrong. But the context is during the time of tribulation. That's when the gospel of the kingdom will be magnified and preached. Will there be judgment? Yes. Will there be tribulation? Yes. But there will also be evangelism. There will also be multitudes coming to faith and putting their faith in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will be the fulfillment of that passage. Now, that describes what I just read to you. That describes the first three and one half years and the time leading into that three and one half years of the seven years of tribulation. I want you to go with me to Daniel chapter 9. Turn with me there. Daniel chapter 9. I want you to see what the prophet Daniel had to say when he looked through the periscope of prophecy and he gave us the word of God. He was praying and Gabriel the archangel or Gabriel the messenger, he came to him and he said, here's what will happen to the people of Israel. All right, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. He said, 70 weeks. Everybody say weeks. Now in the Hebrew language, that actually means sevens. 70 sevens are determined upon your people, the people of Israel. Now 70 times seven, mathematicians, is what? 490. 490 years have been prophetically determined upon the people of Israel. Then he begins to break it down. And upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. This is the mission. Know therefore, verse 25, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks. What is seven sevens? Forty-nine years. And threescore and two weeks. That's King James for 62. So 62 sevens is what? 434 years. Plus 49 years is what? I see your heads. 483 years. 483 plus what equals 490? Seven. seven. So there's a seven-year period that is yet to be fulfilled. And that is called Daniel's 70th week, which is the seven years of a tyrannical reign of an antichrist and a false prophet in this world. Now, what put it in my heart to talk about this this morning was what I saw in Beirut, Lebanon. When I saw that massive explosion, and we don't really know what happened. We don't really know what happened. But to see it live, the way you saw that, that will just be a speck of dust compared to what will happen during this time of Daniel's 70th week. Let's keep reading, then we're going to move to that. All right, look at verse uh, 26. And after three score, after 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. So, after, so what he's saying is, 483 years from now, his prophecy, Christ will have been crucified. Now, what happened there? That began when he sent the Spirit at Pentecost. That began the church age. That began the time of the Gentiles. So now the Lord is bringing Gentiles into the family of God. Can Jews be saved? Yes, if they confess Christ as Savior on an individual level, but not a national level, see. Because when, during the tribulation is when he deals with national Israel. Do you follow me? So we're now living during the time of the Gentiles or the church age, which is the time in between the 69th and the 70th week. Yes. Do you follow me? So 69 of those sevens have been fulfilled. We're just waiting for the 70th seven-year period to take place. Now, what will usher that in? Well, I believe it's the rapture of the church. Then the Antichrist, let's read, let's continue. Don't take my word for it. Look at verse 26. After, three, after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city. That's the temple that Jesus prophesied would be destroyed. 
and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Now, he prophesied this 500 and some years before it actually happened. And into the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, verse 27, I want you to highlight this. And he, everybody say he. This is the Antichrist. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one seven-year period. One week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So after three and a half years, he's going to set himself up in the temple and call himself God. Think about it. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. All right. Now, in Matthew 24, Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world during this time. Let me just give you a brief rundown. All right. Revelation chapter 6 talks about four horsemen of the apocalypse. There's a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. These horses represent things that will be happening during this seven years of tribulation. The white horse is the Antichrist. The Bible says he's riding upon a horse. He has a bow and no arrows. He's all talk, right? He's imitating Christ because Christ is coming back on a white horse at the end of this tribulation period at the Battle of Armageddon. So he's trying to imitate our Lord Jesus, all right? He's an Antichrist. The red horse represents war. Red Russia, I believe. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. All right? Then the black horse, which represents famine. Yes. You can store up all the food you want in a bunker. But if an antichrist realizes that tyrannical government knows that you have it, you think they're going to let you eat it? There will be famine all over the world. And then the pale horse, which is death. Death and destruction like you've never seen before. And when you look at that explosion in Beirut, Lebanon, that's just a speck of dust as to what will take place. I want you to keep that in mind this morning. All right. So during the first three and a half years, that's what's going to be happening. Also, there's going to be 144,000 Jewish evangelists who are raised up to preach the gospel throughout the nation of Israel. Think about this. Now, Jehovah's Witness thinks that there are these 144,000, but there are actually 144,000 Jewish evangelists that the Bible says declare the gospel for at least three and a half years, and multitudes come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Now, they're raptured. These 144,000 are actually raptured at the midpoint of tribulation. Do you realize that? They are raptured out. If they're not martyred, they're raptured out at the midpoint. Now, there's also two witnesses that Revelation chapter 11 talks about. These two witnesses, many believe that they could be uh, Elijah and Enoch. Reason for that is because they never saw physical death. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and he was not. And that Elijah, of course, was taken up in a chariot of fire. So many believe they'll come back to the earth and the Bible says they'll preach the gospel for at least three and a half years, win multitudes to Christ. Now, I don't know how or what, It'll, how it will take place, but it will. And then the Bible says they will be assassinated and that they will lie in the streets for three days. And the scripture says the whole world will view them for three days. Now, 60 years ago, you read that verse and you said, well, how can that happen? Well, today you just pull out your cell phone. You know what I don't like? I don't like people who video bad things happening to other people. Now, you want to talk about a coward I don't know where that came from, but anyway. But you could easily do it now. You can record what's happening, and the whole world could see it easily for three days. And then, after three days, they're lying in the street, and God resurrects them and raptures them out. Oh, hallelujah. I love it. And I want you to get something from this, because even during the darkest times the world will ever see, the gospel will prevail as a light, and people will come to the saving faith of Christ. 
Now, I know Pentecostal churches for years have been talking about a last day revival that will bring in the fold. But I'm telling you, the majority of that revival will be during the tribulation period. The scripture tells me that before we're raptured out of here, there's a great apostasy. There's a turning away from the faith. But in Revelation, we see multitudes from every tribe, tongue, and nation saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. If anything, that gives credence to the gospel of Christ and how powerful it is. Revelation and judgment is the love of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because a just God is giving his people another opportunity to call him Lord and Master. Oh, he's a loving God. And whom the Lord loves, what does he do? He chastens them. He scourges them. He says, stop and do something different. I'm thankful that he does. Because if he didn't, I wouldn't be in this pulpit today and you wouldn't be sitting on that pew. But it's by the grace and mercy of God that we are here. Hallelujah. And it'll be by the grace and mercy of God that Israel comes to faith. Hallelujah. Psalm 83, turn with me. Psalm 83. I want to talk about two last day battles that the scripture talks about that have not been fulfilled. And Lebanon is included in this. And if you're watching live, I pray, I pray that you hear the word of the Lord today. Psalm 83, verse 1. This is a prophetic psalm. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee, highlight that, have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. And verse 4, they have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation. I can't tell you how many times. Iran's government alone has have stated they wanted to take Israel and just push them off of the map. A nation the size of New Jersey. Think about that. Verse 5. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Who are they? Well, let's look at verse 6. The tabernacle of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagarines, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, the Philistines, and Tyre, and Aser. All of these people groups, listen to me this morning. This is important. All of these people groups represent the three bordering nations of Israel. Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. Follow me. Conspiring to get rid of Israel. How quickly could it happen over there? Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon. That's Lebanon. Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. The Gaza Strip. All included in wanting to put Israel off of the map. Make them a people no more. Nowhere in biblical history has this been fulfilled or anything close to it. This is something that is prophetic in the future. And I believe it could happen very easily. Now, go with me, with that in mind, go with me to Daniel chapter 7, quickly. Daniel chapter 7. Hallelujah. Well, I'm doing great on time. Daniel chapter 7. And look with me at a couple of passages here, because Daniel gives us the insight into an antichrist and his kingdom in the last days. And you say, well, why is this important to us? Because I'm sure you have family and friends that need to be born again, right? Amen. And maybe you need to get right with God. I don't know. Look with me. Daniel chapter 7. Look at verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 
ten horns. Everybody say ten horns. This is a ten nation kingdom that the Antichrist will rule. Verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Highlight that. That is the Antichrist. And before whom there were three. Everybody say three. There were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So I believe, my opinion, is that these three are Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. The bordering nations of Israel. And I believe that the battle that will supposedly happen will not happen. I think that the Antichrist having made peace with Israel, with these three bordering nations. Think about it. So now they're dwelling in peace. Which leads me to Ezekiel 38. Go with me there quickly. And I'm going to tie this together for you. Ezekiel 38. This is another battle the scripture talks about that has not been fulfilled. It's referred to, and I'm sure you've heard it, the battle of Gog and Magog. How does this fit into prophetic scripture and last day battles. Well, I've told you that Psalm 83, the three nations bordering Israel, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, all right? I believe the Antichrist has him in his mouth. I believe he's already taken those nations politically and religiously. I believe that. A, he will be a major political leader. Think about it, all right? And religious leader, I believe. All right, now look with me. Uh, Ezekiel 38 and the word of the Lord, verse 1, came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses, horsemen, and all them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with the bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Verse 5, get this, underline them. Persia, these are the people involved. These are the countries involved. Persia, Ethiopia, with them, and all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, and all the hands of the house of Togomar, and of the north quarters. Highlight that. What is the north quarters? Not directly north, but the north quarters of Israel. Big old red Russia. Listen to me and all his bands, and many people with thee. Now understand this. When we go through the list of these nations, there's seven nations listed here. Seven plus three is what? How many nations does he have in his kingdom? Ten. Three is already in his mouth. He already has three subdued. Notice that none of the bordering nations are mentioned here. Amen. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan are not even mentioned here. Who is mentioned? I'll tell you who. Gog is the leader. That's the Antichrist. Magog is the land of Meshach and Tubal, which is when you, when you trace it back through Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, you get the land in the area of Russia. Then there is Persia, which is modern-day Iran and Afghanistan. Then you have Ethiopia, that's northern Africa. Libya is western Africa. Gomar is Germany, ladies and gentlemen. Then you have Togomar, which is modern-day Turkey. You have all these nations conspiring to come down against Israel and wipe them out. But notice, the three bordering nations aren't mentioned. Here's what I think happens. Let's read. Will you go with me? Look at verse uh, number 9. And thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. And thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. That's a lot of soldiers, isn't it? And thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass, that as the same time shall things come into thy mind. And thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. That's important. Because these nations are conspiring to go against a land that is unwalled. It's at peace. How could they be at peace? Well, if the surrounding nations are at peace with them, they're going to be at peace. So these seven nations will come down like a storm, the Bible says, and come down like a flood on an unwalled nation. 
I will go, verse 11, to them that are at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls. They're living in peace and having their bars nor gates to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are none inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Now these are the nations that have used the nation of Israel, used the Middle East as a prophet to themselves. Read with me. Verse 13, Sheba, Dedan. Sheba is Yemen. Dedan is Saudi Arabia. And notice what it says. With all the young lions. Many think this represents America. The western countries. And the sad thing about this, if that's the case, we have nothing to do with what's going on. Which means we're no longer a country or we've pulled back from helping the nation of Israel. Think about that. Well, let's see what happens, shall we? Look at verse Look at verse 22. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. This is how the Lord's going to respond. When Red Russia and these nations come together and conspire against Israel, they're going to come down to destroy the nation. And before they get there, the Lord is going to rain down fire and hailstones and destroy the armies. But here's the interesting thing. Look at chapter 39 and verse, 20, verse 9. 39 verse 9. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, and bows and arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire for how long? Seven years. Seven years. So here's what I think. Revelation 13 says that this Antichrist will deceive the very elect. That he will call fire down from heaven. I think this Antichrist will take credit for this battle. I think he has three nations under his arm already. Syria, Lebanon, Jordan. And then when these seven nations come down to conspire and fire comes down to destroy these nations, it could be nuclear, I don't know. But we know that God is in control of that. But I believe the Antichrist will take credit for what the Lord did. And that's how he'll be able to say, sign a treaty with me for seven years. And you'll have a job taking care of burning all the weapons of mass destruction for seven years. Daniel's 70th week. I tell you all that to tell you this. When you see things happening like that in Lebanon, the media is quiet about it. The media is quiet about the rockets that have been launched to and from Israel in the past month that you didn't even know about from surrounding nations. Why? Because we're so captivated by what's going on here, we're forgetting about who we provide support and an ally to the nation of Israel and how that the nation itself is wanting to take Netanyahu and pull him out. Did you know that? Surrounded his house a few weeks ago in Israel and said, we want you gone. What I'm saying is that all this could happen today. Today. And you got preachers out there declaring how good things are going to get and how good things are going to be. And how you're, you're living a blessed life. Folks, this is not my best life. Amen. And it's not yours. Amen. And any little preacher you watch his little quotes and clips on YouTube and whatever, 
to build you up, turn it off. Because the only way you can be built up is by looking up because your redemption draws nigh. Oh, hallelujah. In fact, let me take you to Titus, and I'm going to close here. Titus chapter 2, in closing. And I believe that with all this on the horizon, that we should be fervent about who we are as the people of God. I know wearing a mask is respectful and it's polite and all this, but I have a problem with a government telling me I have to do it. And so should you. And so should you who's watching. You should have a problem with that. Because if they tell you you have to do something, guess what? You will believe them the next time they tell you you have to do it. And the Antichrist is going to say you have to do it. And if you'll do something like wear a mask at the bowing at the knee of a government, you will take a chip in your arm. Come on, amen. Come on now. And you think during a time when the church is out of here and you can't come here on Sunday morning and hear preaching like this? And you can't make it now, you think you'll make it then? You think God's just going to overlook your rebellious child and your rebellious family member? No! And we as the people of God, we've got to pray. And we've got to seek God. And we've got to train up our children in the way they should go. Oh, hallelujah. Look with me, Titus 2 verse 13. Looking. Here it is. Here's what I'm doing. Looking for that blessed hope. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What did he do? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things he told uh, Titus, speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man despise you. I'm telling you, and I'll tell whoever wants to watch and listen, that we are going to look for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ, because here's what he did. He went to Calvary's cross so that you and I could be forgiven of all sin, and one drop of the red shed blood was able to remit every sin, every iniquity that we would ever commit or ever will commit. Jesus Christ is my Savior.